see. Oh, there I am. <laughs> okay. Great. So um, I'm going to just do a short intro and then we'll start the presentation. Um, okay, share my. So the, um, welcome, I'm Matthew Jones. I am at the University of Michigan at LearnXP. I'll be moderating this session on OpenCast powering Harvard's Division of Continuing Education Distance Education. Um, before I begin, uh, just let you know this is being recorded in the cloud. You'll have an email announcement once they're available. If you have any comments or questions, please type them in the chat and I will ask them. Um, at the end, if we have time, you can ask your questions um, if we have QA time. And then uh, we just want you to mute yourself while, you're, while the speaker is presenting. Um, the, uh, your speaker for this presentation is Karen Dolan, a software developer at Harvard University. Division of Continuing Education. She has been programming, developing, and architecting data integration and software solutions for 30 years. Karen currently works on improving learning environment of distance education students and the staff that support those students. She has been a contributor to OpenCast since 2013. Karen? Thank you, Matthew. Um, so let me share. Um, Are you, am I still on Zoom? Here? Yeah, you should okay. be co-host and have. Yeah, okay, let me just, my apologies. I just have to figure out, share screen. There we are, fine. Oh, okay, let's just see if I can. Yep, we see it. Are you seeing the full screen version or the current slide one of four? I see the full screen version. Good, okay. All right, hi, I'm Karen Dolan. As Matthew mentioned, um, I'm here to talk about OpenCast and uh, why we're using OpenCast and uh, some of the due diligence we've done um, with other systems and why we're continuing to use OpenCast for our site. Um, this is the agenda for the topics I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna just briefly talk about lecture capture. Um, I assume people here know about lecture capture or, or let me know if you don't know about lecture capture. I'm just going to touch on that, what it is and, and touch a high level overview of what OpenCast is. And then I'm going to talk about why we started using OpenCast and why we continue to uh, choose OpenCast over all the alternatives. And then finally, some of the adopter features that you should consider if you're thinking about OpenCast for your system, for your site. So lecture capture, um, traditionally at DCE where I work, the, we have a hardware devices in classrooms. We have about 24 classrooms with these hardware devices um, that you have a camera that's pointed at the instructor at the podium. You see that top image is the instructor at the podium. And then uh, the hardware device has a wire that goes and captures that video and then also uh, is hooked into the presentation of the instructor where, or another camera to the blackboard or whatever the instructor is using to demonstrate the material. So two, two videos. And at the bottom you see the web conference. So after spring break, the COVID-19, we all uh, converted to online and we're using web conference tool. And you can see the image is also of the instructor sitting at home and and then another movie, which is the presentation. So very similar um, to the classroom lecture, except there's no students in the classroom. So our distance students, um, I should mention at DCE, uh, we're continuing education. We support distance students all over the globe. And some of them can attend web conference or live classroom, and some of them cannot. They have other obligations, family or work. So they have to be able to access the recorded material uh, at their own time. And so we guarantee that for them. So it's really important for us to, ha to have that material available for them when it's recorded. So uh, just a little bit more about us, uh, the sources of recorded material, uh, lecture capture I mentioned, you can see that when graph at the bottom there uh, in February, it was primarily lecture capture from the classrooms. And then right after, you know, spring break, it was all web conference uh, recorded captures and uh, processing distribution. 
The other two types are manual uploads. So the instructor might have their own recorded video or a movie or some other media that they want to expose to their students that they can manually upload and then republish is when we take lectures from previous terms or other courses, uh, classes, and they can publish them within their class to their students. Those are the four types. And we'd have about 600 uh, recorded media a month during the regular term that goes through our, our lecture processing, which is OpenCast. So here's a very high level view of OpenCast too. You can see at the top there, uh, scheduling um, for the lecture capture in classroom, we use OpenCast as a scheduling um, service, but for the web conference, we use a separate scheduling service. Uh, a live event happens, the recording is captured on the web conference host. We have this other tool that knows about the schedule and knows about OpenCast and is able to go and, and grab the recordings from the web conference host and feed them into OpenCast. So once OpenCast gets them, it does a lot of processing on them. Um, we have these three main workflows that we run on ingested media um, that we may or may not have a human intervention. So that first workflow uh, cleans up the media, might normalize it, inspect it to see how big it is and how, uh, how long it is. And then we might have a human uh, intervention to trim it, trim out the bad parts, or it might be automatically moved to the second workflow, which encodes the media into multiple formats, you know, segments. It might extract text from the, the slide movies and uh, image transitions um, to help students navigate the, the video more easily when they, when they get to it later. So that third process there is uh, after another human might review it before it's published to students to make sure that all the content is good and the quality is good. And so OpenCast has a lot of operations that you can run on media. And at the very bottom there, that cloud, it just shows the media is in multiple formats to make it easier to view wherever you are, whatever your bandwidth is, and um, transcriptions, captions, um, image uh, transitions, and normalized audio, and anything that will make the, the experience better for the student who has to watch it after the fact. Ooh, okay, 10 minutes. So this is just the high level of the OpenCast admin UI. You get a big overview of what's going on with the system. That action column on the right there just shows you, you can trim it, you can uh, review it, and then you can publish it. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick drill down. If you click on the details of any event, you can uh, drill down to all sorts of details. This is just a summary of like all the workflow operations that happened on that specific event for that workflow. So. You can actually drill down further and see how long each operation took. It's kind of, it's good for debugging and it's good to get an overall view of the system. One more drill down on the media. You just, so you can see that the detail that you can get on, on the different components that have been generated. Still sharing, okay. <laughs> so why did we choose OpenCast originally? Um, this was about seven or eight years ago. We had a very homegrown system. It was, uh, had a good product at the end, but it had a lot of human intervention had a, for a lot of the steps. It was just manually intensive. And so it couldn't scale because if you're going to scale, you'd have to hire more people. And that was no good at the time. OpenCast was um, getting a lot of publicity. Uh, we could look at the source because it was open source. And we could see that it was very modular and scalable. And it uh, was kind of a no brainer to migrate our homegrown system to OpenCast originally. Um, it took us about a year to do it. Um, this was OpenCast maybe earlier than 1.0. Um, OpenCast 5 got very stable. And then of course it's, it's uh, version 8.5 right now, the stable version, which is really stable. But this was eight years ago. It took us about a year to get um, it completely reliable in the quality we wanted. And so once we did that, we had a feature frenzy on it. So we, we added all sorts of extra features that we didn't have opportunity to, to do with our homegrown system because we didn't have the time to do it. So we, we optimized it to make it even faster with parallel encodings. Um, so the speed, the turnaround time for the student to get the recording was, was faster. Um, 
We ported everything to the cloud using Amazon Web Services um, so we could centralize logging, centralize uh, distribution uh, to, to help us distribute the media around the globe and, uh, and save money to could we scale up workers and scale down workers using the services. It was very easy um, to get a lot of flexibility in how you deploy your system with the cloud. So we were able to optimize um, getting the media out to the students to make the lag time uh, a lot less for them and uh, so they could download the higher quality videos even if they're on the other side of the planet. Uh, we did a lot of features to help us archive and recover media so we wouldn't lose anything. Um, to do analytic, well, this was uh, to be proactive on the health of the system so that we could uh, not have to recover from downtime, but we could prevent downtime uh, much more easily by seeing the health of the system, you know, add more security to the system. We could customize the look and feel. We added um, student engagement features um, to the UI. We integrated with our LMS or LTI and uh, we also now have more time to do analytics over the usage of the the data and also the transcriptions created from the courses we can assess what type of material is taught across disciplines um, by uh, analyzing their the types of things that are taught in each class by by looking at the text generated from the transcriptions so a lot of features that we were able to do because we had the stable base at opencast so um, yes, yeah, so, so we, we've been using OpenCast for seven years and uh, other vendors' uh, tools are available for lecture capture. So we certainly have to look at what's out there to see um, if OpenCast is still the right fit for us. And uh, we did a two semester pilot with one of the vendor tools just last summer and fall. And then had a retrospective at the end to see, you know, what were the pros and cons of the system and uh, And it's OpenCast still the best fit and we decided that OpenCast was the best fit and I, this is me pulling out from the big long list of pros and cons and um, the three kind of Overarching factors that I felt kind of represented um, Some of the negatives of the vendor solution and um, and how OpenCast uh, had more pro than con on these. <laughs> so at the local sport, I'm going to just start with, so that's us at the site. And one of the myths I think of uh, hiring a vendor is that they'll do all the work, you know, that you're going to free up labor at your site because uh, the vendor, you're paying them lots of money to solve problems. And the reality was that uh, we ended up having to solve a lot of problems um, and and then analyze how the system was running and prevent any downtime. It, the onus was kind of on us to do that, even with the vendor solution. And also we kind of had to prove, have evidence that issues were not caused by our site and that they were in fact issues that the vendor needed to, to chime in on, to give us information about. And so that's, that was another factor that was kind of a negative with the vendor support is that um, there's not a lot of transparency with the issue system. With the vendor, you'd open a ticket and you'd have the person who opened the ticket and the person on the vendor side. And uh, it didn't, that model doesn't work for us because we have a whole team at our site where we have managers, we have technical people, we have support, we have instructional designers and we all kind of need to see the health of the system. And when you just have a one-on-one -on -one ticket system, it's very hard uh, to see them at a high level um, because if the person wasn't there on the vendor side, then you wouldn't get an answer until they returned. Um, and also when the, the, if there was downtime and the system came back, you just get the answer that uh, the problem is solved and you wouldn't know if it was something where you could build in some redundancy to stop it from ever happening again. You didn't have the kind of in-depth ability to see what the problem was that you would when, when you own the, the product. And the last, the big one here was also, um, 
So we have uh, needs and requirements and ideas for, for what lecture capture and processing distribution can do for the students and some ideas. And a lot of times the vendors said, oh yeah, that's a great idea. We could totally see other universities needing that. And we were put it on our roadmap. We'll, we'll totally do that. And then other ideas, they said, oh, that's really specific to your site. You know, we don't see how uh, the cost of building that would, would help us, you know, sell the product anymore. So we really had to be at the mercy of the priorities of the vendor, um, which impacted, you know, our ability to, to innovate the product. So customize, you know, the ability to customize um, the product you use is, is a strong motivator for us. And it's something to consider when you're looking at these vendor products. So these are some, you know, considerations in the past, OpenCast has been considered very difficult to implement, complicated, a lot of uh, configuration choices, and that vendors uh, would kind of be able to do it all for you. But um, OpenCast is getting, with each release, is getting a little more user friendly and easier to use. The default custom configuration, well, the default configurations are getting more reasonable. Um, and it's getting packaged a lot more easily to use. The vendor solutions, if you go with a vendor, you just have to think about, are they gonna be flexible enough for you and your changing needs in this time of uncertainty? In this time of uncertainty, can they really adapt as fast as you need them to adapt? Um, so this is to address, uh, in the past, the, the perception that OpenCast was um, difficult and complicated to use. There's um, OpenCast Studio. You can see the URL there, studio.opencast.org. <laughs> you can go right to the site now and actually you can, you can play with this, with this demo. It's, um, it's also connected to the developer.opencast.org. So you can, you can have a whole run through of OpenCast from beginning to end just to get a feel of the, the product and the studio.opencast.org is open source as well. You can download this and, and run it locally on your computer. I think it's Linux based. So if you have Mac or CentOS or a Linux based system, you'd be able to run this. Um, but so this is me making a recording just like I am right now with the uh, video. I share my camera, I share my slides, I make a recording, I can trim it if I don't like it, I can discard it and re-record it. And when I like it, I hit that next, next button in the lower right. And uh, I get the screen so I can see on the right there, I can download the two recordings to my uh, hard drive or on the left, I can upload to OpenCast. So this demo actually is connected to developer.opencast.org with the default username and password. So you could upload a test recording there, which I did, uh, but you could also point it to your own OpenCast system as well. You don't have to, to point it to the developer one, of course. So me being the geek, as soon as I uploaded, I immediately went to that <clears throat> developer, the opencast.org and looked at the workflow chugging along. And I know this is gonna be small, but um, you can see the steps that it succeeded and you know it's extracting text from the slides and images from the slides. And when it gets down to that third to the last published to engage, I know that I can play it and see what it looks like. So, the developer version, uh, developer.opencast.org has what it's gonna be, opencast9.x. There's also a stable.opencast.org that has the latest stable version of OpenCast, which is 8.5. Um, but here, the Pi player is in, the developer version is the default player and I can play my video. Yeah, there are these plugin icons on the lower right, so I can search by extracted text. Um, portions of the video that I want to go to and I can move the slides around. I can share them on social media uh, and I can zoom in and out, that sort of thing. Uh, Paya is quite modular the same way that OpenCast is. It's this player construction. So it's easy to make plugins. And so we, I just want to show one of the plugins that we made. This is the social plugin that I, I mentioned, the student engagement uh, earlier during our feature frenzy. And, um, this is where the student can go uh, open up 
this plugin, which pops up text that other students have written uh, in the timeline of the video, and then they can respond to other people's texts and uh, make their own comments. And some instructors actually require this sort of interaction with the video uh, as part of their participation grade. So students actually have to, to make comments and engage this way in certain courses. But it's a, it's a tool that is relatively easy to do with the open source and the existing um, plugins that was there. It would be a lot harder to do with the vendor product, this sort of engagement tool. So OpenCast does have vendors. Uh, LON, um, EV, S Systems, Teltech have been along, around for a long time. I know Alon supports 15 other universities um, in setting up and maintaining their OpenCast system. There's also a very strong, enthusiastic community around OpenCast that loves to answer questions. Um, the source is on GitHub and there's Docker containers as well, if you're familiar with Docker, to help you speed your, your deployment of OpenCast for your, for your site. And those are maintained by an enthusiastic group as well. Wow, I'm speeding through this, aren't I? 10 minutes. Yeah, there's uh, about <laughs> seven, uh, six minutes left. There are a couple of questions. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, this is pretty much, I, I'm at the end here. So I just wanted to say there are some resources um, to play around with the OpenCast Studio there so you can get a good feel of kind of the user interface aspect of OpenCast and, and what the students might get with the player and how easy it is to actually just use OpenCast with the defaults. Um, and there's a getting started page to help you uh, if you want to download and install and get a feel for OpenCast and, and, and some of the configuration options you have and the, the Docker containers at the bottom and of course the link to the Perio. Uh, project for OpenCast. So. All right, Matthew, what, what are the questions? Great. Uh, thanks. I definitely learned a lot more about OpenCast than uh, I haven't seen OpenCast myself for a couple of years. So okay. seeing it at, at this conference in this format and these sessions, it was, it was really helpful to me too. Great. So. Um, the first question was from Aurelio. It was, uh, what are some of the other cloud competitors you are looking at to run OpenCast and why did you choose AWS? Oh, uh, why we chose AWS, I think it was mostly that there was probably ultimately that there's a lot of on-site knowledge of AWS and we have a, I think Harvard has a contract with AWS, so it was easier for us to start going that way. Um, we haven't done, I think, a lot of due diligence with other cloud vendors um, just because we had this easier access to AWS than maybe other universities might have. So um, I, I can say it's been very good for us in general, the flexibility of being able to scale up workers, you know, and get analytic information on, on how the nodes are doing through AWS. But I imagine other cloud uh, vendors have very similar competitive tools like that. Um, we just, we haven't, uh, explored all the tools of AWS yet and we're still doing that. So I think it would be harder probably to, to do comparisons with the cloud tools than it was with actually the lecture capture. Uh, Greg, Greg Logan said it's cloud agnostic. It would, would absolutely run in any cloud. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. OpenCast would run in any cloud, but yeah. as far as our, our choices, yeah, we just, right. we could have chosen anything, but yeah. Okay, uh, another question from Aurelio too. Is there any whiteboard type integration tool you currently use or push faculty to use? We do not. Um, you mean for when they're doing their presentations, uh, they can yeah. use whatever they want to use. Uh, we just need to capture an output stream from whatever tool they use. So yeah, they people use the old fashioned light bulb projectors and um, in that case, we have a camera at whatever screen they're presenting to, so we can capture whatever the instructor prefers to use in their demonstrations. Okay, and um, Christina asked about accessibility. It looked like it was kind of answered by Greg. How does OpenCast do for accessibility? Um, I don't know if anything to add to that. Uh, Greg said the player was pretty good. The admin UI is something they want to improve on. Um, they're working on that. But. Yes, yeah, so it's community driven project as well. So anyone who's got a lot of skills of accessibility is 
very welcome to, to, to look at it. We are, for our site, we are very concerned with accessibility too. So any tools, tools we build, we have to add the ARIA labeling and that, all that sort of thing so that people can navigate around it. We have not done um, contracted uh, user testing for accessibility yet, but that's, that's on our slate. Okay, those, those are all the questions so far. Um, there's still two minutes. I don't know if anyone else had questions. Any last comments? Oh, so it was a thank you from Aurelio. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind, I'm jumping in on the microphone to kind of sure, follow up yeah. on that question. Um, so the reason I was asking about an active whiteboard is because since we've gone online um, this past semester, we had a lot of faculty asking about capturing their whiteboard or something at home uh, because they're no longer in the classroom or allowed to be on campus. Yeah. Uh, one of the projects I was looking at was open board, which is an uh, open source uh, whiteboard type of feature. So I was just wondering if there's any integration uh, with any tool similar to that. No, I'm just expanding my question. I'm not expecting another answer. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine if, so with the web conference, so we use Zoom too for our web conference. Um, you know how you, you can select which device you want to share or which screen you want to share. If Zoom, if that whiteboard allows it to be discovered so that you can share the whiteboard instead of, you know, a browser window or something like that, um, then, then it's a no brainer basically to, to be able to capture that stream. But um, I, I guess the difficulty would be to to make sure that that whiteboard is uh, discoverable by um, something that wants to capture the stream, or if this the whiteboard stream can be recorded somehow if they have that built into the product. But actually, that sounds interesting to know that there's an open source whiteboard. Yeah, I'll show the link in the chat. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to jump in here real quick. Um, hi, folks. I'm Greg Logan. I'm the QA person for OpenCast. Um, I was just looking at the OpenPort website and I see it's based out of Switzerland. One of our largest adopters is Switch, which is the national, um, sort of a national internet body for Switzerland that is running OpenCast at scale for, I think it was 12 universities in Switzerland. Um, so dollars to donuts, one of those universities is using OpenPort in some way, but I'm not sure how I hadn't heard. I hadn't heard about it before this presentation. Um, so if this is something that sounds interesting with OpenCast, I mean, by all means, hop on the users list because uh, Switch is generally pretty active in terms of getting back to people. The users list is very enthusiastic to answer questions. So that is a great place to go, the OpenCast. Um, Greg, how do they get there? It's just a Google group that... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a Google group. Uh, <laughs> It's, I've been a member of this group for so long that I don't actually remember how to get to it. I, it's users at opencast.org is how I interact with it. I just send email, um, but it is a, a Google group. So there are forum, there is a forum view of it. Um, I, let me see if I can pull up how to get to it real quick. Probably the opencast.org website. I imagine they have pages on, on interacting with the community. So if, if you're interested, yeah, go to that. that um, website today. Yeah, the opencast.org. It's got a lot of info. All right, um, thanks. It's uh, one minute past, then lightning talks are coming up next. At, okay. Uh, in 10 minutes, so thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Karen.